Michael Saylor, of course, goes all in on Bitcoin once again. Is this going to be the period in which Michael Saylor could be leading out the bull run? We'll break it down for you guys today. Don't miss it. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. I want to thank our sponsor today, and that is Tangem. If you're looking at self-custody, this should be the place you're going. Check out Tangem.com. And of course, all you have to do is, is jump into their offerings there. They've got a ring. You can also use the cards. The cards are pretty slick and easy. The best thing about this wallet is it is one of the easiest to set up. It's also one of the most secure. So make sure and check out Tangem.com. Use our link down in the description below. All you have to do is hit that little Get Tangent button, get the three card set, or if you want and take a look at the ring, you can go over there and pre-order that right now. I think they've begun shipping on this ring. So pretty cool for the use of self-custody. If you've not started self-custody, do it now. Get some of your tokens off exchanges and start holding through this bull run. All right, let's get into a couple of topics today. Of course, the big one is Michael Saylor. What does he know that everybody else is looking at. If you look at the top holders right now, entities of Bitcoin, this is in September of 2024, Coinbase still pretty much holding it all at about 134 billion. Satoshi Nakamoto right there at the top with Binance and then guess who leads the pack on the regular companies and that is BlackRock at 21 billion, now surpassing Michael Saylor by a significant amount at 14 billion holding, Grayscale right behind him. The U.S. government, Bitfinex, OKX, Kraken round out the top 10 in terms of Bitcoin overall. And if you look at just what's happening right here, here's the headline, micro, micro, micro strategy buys an additional 18,300 Bitcoin. This is another billion bucks that's coming into it. And when you look at this average at around 60,000, uh, his entry point, 1.1 billion. Software giant now is more recognized as a Bitcoin bull than its primary business venture. And the firm now has increased its total Bitcoin bag to 244,809.45 billion. So with that being the case, you look at the average overall, and they're claiming that he's somewhere around 38,000 per token on uh, Bitcoin. So not a bad position. Metal Lawman comes in, says, hey, dear sailor, that's a lot of Bitcoin. Please consider donating some of that to, Senator, to defeat Senator Warren and elect uh, Deaton for Senate. Uh, and if we've had John on before, and of course, Metal Lawman, friend of the show, Tyler and Cameron uh, are donating some Bitcoin over there. So good for them. By the way, if you guys are not subscribed to our Diamond Circle, make sure and get in on that. You guys can just go over to Paul Baron Network. We'll leave a link down below. But these are some of the things that are available to you. We have additional content over there. Very easy to sign up. It'll take you over to our membership page. And when you're there, all you have to do is jump into that Diamond Circle. That's our free package where you guys get additional content. Very easy to do. We'll leave a link down in the description. All right. Looking at the current market, S&P 500 right now has added about 1.8 trillion of market cap. So we're heavy in the green right now. NVIDIA is up over 15% this week. And the S&P is now just 1% away from a new to all time high again. And I think a lot of people are looking at what's going to happen next Wednesday. And that of course is going to be a chair Powell and his, um, you know, rate cut bonanza. The question is going to be how much. Uh, there is a surge of positive Bitcoin commentary across social media. So I think that's come in over the last uh, couple of weeks. So much of that ratio of positive comment is now more than double that amount of negative comments. So maybe for the first time, are we nearing a time in which we could be entering a bull run? And I think when you look at some of the Bitcoin dominance, just to give you a quick look at the chart, look at this trend upwards. If we dip below this little trend line right here, could we be entering altcoin season right now? But we are hovering on its local high at about 57.4% on Bitcoin dominance. So significant in the way of are and is this the next step for a bull run going forward? And as of right now, Bitcoin is still hovering around that 59K mark and coming in up almost 3% on the day uh, right now. Yeah, nice green candle right there painting up on the daily or on the weekly. Let's take a look at the daily starting to edge up here for the week. So not bad holding on uh, for Bitcoin right now. Let me know what you, what are you guys uh, investing in right now? Are you primarily going into Bitcoin or are you looking at things like Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche? Where are you guys uh, jumping into? I want to take a look of course right now and that is the Fed rate cut. The odds of that going to a 50 basis point have surged as Bitcoin remains stable at around 58K. The fact that we've seen such a move up on the 50 basis to me is surprising because we could be in a very interesting 
position? Because I think a lot of people have said, hey, listen, the 50 may be admitting that something is broken, meaning possibly the labor, labor numbers, which continually come in, uh, not in a position that the Fed wants, even though inflation is now starting to decline, which is not surprising. I talk about this all the time. When people don't have jobs, deflation will decline because there's not people spending money. So when people aren't spending money, businesses are not raising prices, hence you don't get inflation. And I think that's the question mark going forward. Fun fact, next week will be the Fed's first rate cut since this cycle on September 18th, all the way back into its first rate cut in 2007. If you guys remember, 2007, one of the biggest uh, recessions we've ever had in 08. That took a long cycle to get out of that. So be thinking about this. If in fact something is broken, then uh, we could be in a little bit of a, a, a tizzy in terms of the markets overall. Kobe EC letter comes in. Gold just hit another all-time high despite markets pricing out a 50 basis point. Markets pricing out geopolitical risk, meaning they think everything's okay. Volatility is dropping to a new monthly low. And then you've got inflation data coming in above expectations, meaning lower ex inflation. Markets pricing out possibility of recession, soft landing. So what do you have? Gold moving. So what is happening? Does gold know something that we don't know? And is there a possibility that the Fed maybe has mistimed this? Again, we'll see if this starts to play out. Now, I've got a clip here that gets into it because it's talking about this whole scenario around a 50 basis points and how Powell would respond to this. Take a look. This whole narrative that the kite is flying again on 50 basis points, our guests have said, tuck it away. What do you think of the journal article? Yeah. What do you think of the risk of 50 basis points, the risk and necessity? Yes, well, good morning. Thank you for having me. I don't think we can rule out a 50 basis point cut. I think the important thing that we've emphasized, though, is that the depth and the drivers of this rate cutting cycle really matter for corporate credit sentiment and I think risk assets more broadly. If there is a start to the cycle that begins with a 50 basis point rate cut, I think the messaging needs to be very crisp around where the neutral rate is, why we are starting with a non-traditional uh, magnitude of cuts, because absent that sort of clear messaging that we are doing this to get back to a neutral territory, I think the market could interpret that to mean that they are responding to some sort of growth downside. So I think the messaging around the drivers is really important. And then more broadly, leaving kind of this year's rate cuts aside, uh, we believe that there's scope for the Fed to cut to the, say, call it three and a quarter, three and a half percent range next year. And then we we need to have start having more clear conversations around where is neutral, where is the destination. It's not to say that they couldn't cut beyond that level, but I think once we start to get in that zip code, I think it becomes a more finely balanced decision as to are we normalizing or are we actually easing. So Amanda Lanham there from BlackRock talking about that. Two points she hits on, which I think are important, and that is, and it's always been kind of the scenario, is that there is a traditional framework of a quarter point coming out of these kinds of pressured financial conditions in markets like what we faced. If we go to the 50 and he does take us there, I think she's right. The narrative has to be super solid for them to give a, a reason why. Now there could be some macro data coming in. I think the macro data is most likely jobs related and possibly the growth numbers uh, that will come in on GDP that would slow. If we see all of that, it would mean that we have a retracing economy and that could change the scenario in the S&P 500 in a big way. So this maybe is the last little hurrah, and maybe that's the reason we're seeing gold on a spike. I think, though, that we're going to continue to see crypto moving on, and there's a couple of reasons why. One of them is this right here. This is a fresh analysis from James Delmore. He's talking about where the crypto industry has uh, given, industry has given almost 190, let me zoom in on that, 190 million in political donations in 2024, most likely that's going to go, I think, to well over 200 million before the election is over. And that in itself is going to start to change the dynamics inside of business and politics and power in the corporate infrastructure out there. So you think about that, 200 million right now moving in, possibly could see continuation of that in through the lobby firms that could take us into easily a billion dollars over the next few years maybe even faster uh, going forward. And of course, what that means is that we're going to see advances on policy 
around crypto. The minute we see advances on policy in the United States around crypto, that's when this market is absolutely going to explode beyond anything you can imagine. 100K Bitcoin is not even in the cards. It'll be well past that in terms of the future. Here's a clip talking about taxes, though, and why it's important. Both candidates are now saying we've got some new tax pay breaks in store. Take a look. You could call it the great tax giveaway. In fact, both Harris and Trump adding new tax breaks and credits during the ca campaigns to target key voters. Trump started with a $4 trillion tax cut that's now added $200 billion in corporate tax cuts. That's to bring the corporate rate to 15 percent for those domestic manufacturers. He would eliminate the tax on Social Security. That's a $1.6 trillion gift to older voters. And he wants to exempt tip wages. That could cost around $200 billion over 10 years. Harris matching that tip wage handout and raising Trump with a new $6,000 child tax credit. That's triple the current credit. She also may use tax credits for that new $25,000 home buying assistance. She announced a $50,000 deduction for business startups, and she wants to extend the 2017 tax cuts for those making less than $400,000 a year. In total, Trump proposing tax cuts of about $6.5 trillion. That doesn't count last night's announcement. His team saying the tariffs will help pay for it. Harris planning about $4.2 trillion in cuts. She would raise taxes, of course, on high earners and companies. That would be about $5 trillion of offsets. But nobody can score these things now because every day we get a new tax giveaway. Well, I think the key here is uh, where is it going to come from? Because at some point the Americans are going to ask about this in the sense of just physical, uh, fiscal uh, responsibility of how we need to get the government back in line in terms of spending. And a lot of that, I think, is going to blow into you know, a, a couple of different areas and everything could be just on growth and innovation, which gets back to crypto. And all you have to do is start to open up these, you know, industries that are trying to grow and let them, let, you know, let them cook, as they say. And I think if the U.S. becomes a center for crypto and blockchain, you're going to see all sorts of companies centering around Wall Street. Why is that important? Well, you have Jeremy Allaire and Circle moving their headquarters over to Wall Street right now, going into New York City, one World Trade Center. This simply means that they are now in the financial district. And what does that mean for Circle? It means that they have now become the de facto possible digital asset out there in terms of a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison of the U.S. dollar. And I think this is going to be a factor because many people would look at this and say, well, wait a minute, has USDC just become the CBDC? That's the real question mark. They have talked about this many times. And when you look at the amount of stable coins in use, let me kind of zoom in on that. 99% of 160 billion stable coins circulating in the market today are backed by U.S. dollars or treasuries. If you're a central banker outside the U.S., this should terrify you because your citizens can now easily swap in and out of your local currency. and You can't really stop it. This is a problem I think that we will continue to see. But I wouldn't necessarily put it all in the dollar because when you compare USDC, and USDT tether, it's not even a race. So the real question is how big do stable coins truly get and do they become the de facto trading mechanism for uh, currencies out there? You look at this though, there are some other things happening around centralization, especially when it comes to Bitcoin. Coinbase wrap Bitcoin now hits a hundred million dollar in market cap in one day. All right. If you look at the numbers, they exceeded 100 million in market cap after its first day. Likelihood of this is going to be pretty accelerated, I think, in terms of leveraging Bitcoin. So fungibility of CBDC, CB, BTC on Coinbase will enable retail and institutional holdings of Bitcoin to seamlessly integrate with its on-chain ecosystem. And we're going to probably start to see a, quite a bit of, um, you know, we'll call it the degenerate you know, out there that are going to start playing uh, against this for sure. This could explode total assets on base pretty rapidly. Uh, this was, of course, Justin Sun uh, weighing in on this, expressing some skepticism about the token's lack of proof of reserve audits. That's a big issue that has been out there for some time. He also goes on to state that a single government subpoena could freeze on-chain Bitcoin instantly, making decentralization a joke. That is true. But that could happen on any centralized exchange today in the United States. Outside the U.S., different story. On DeFi, different story. Inside your uh, cold storage or and or um, wallets, different story. So 
I think the narrative is still very solid for crypto as a whole, but you're going to start seeing more and more people, especially people that are coming to crypto for the first time because they don't necessarily understand the true narrative of what crypto is. And I think that's the, the big miss right here because you're going to continue to see people putting tokens in these exchanges. Last up, I just want to hit on one other thing just to show you the size and capacity of what some of these markets are doing. This is uh, OnlyFans. Not that OnlyFans is part of crypto, but I just want to show a comparison. OnlyFans revealed a record-breaking revenue, $6.6 billion last year. Now, put this in a little bit of framework. Compare that to the NBA combined payroll of $4.9 billion and OnlyFans, a company, $6.6 billion coming in uh, around content creators and, of course, the company itself. So it's a little bit misleading there. But the point that they are at that level uh, is pretty significant. Guess what? There is one token out there that has a similar scenario, and that is only one. This is a token we've reported on before, and of course, this is just in the one day. There's the spike right there, of course, on everybody going, wait a minute, Only OnlyFans is doing $6.6 billion? Well, the crypto equivalent right there on only one. Check it out if you guys. It's called Like. Last up, I'll take a look at a couple of tokens right here. And one, of, one I do want to take a look at, of course, Bitcoin right here. You can kind of see the daily starting to edge up. We may crack back over that 60K mark, which is a real critical point right now. And maybe all the way back up to 63 or 64. Again, that gets into a couple of points, even though we are seeing a little bit of downtrend on sentiment. Let me take a look at ETH holding in back at around 2,400 after a dipping uh, pretty significantly all the way back to really uh, its price in January of 2024. That's on the weekly. If you go to the daily, ETH also been somewhat sideways for quite a while, for sure. Solana uh, getting ready to move uh, quite a bit here on the daily, up uh, cracking uh, 137. Uh, we may see this uh, pull back slightly. Money flow is coming out a little bit. Avalanche going to 24. I think this one is maybe in a position where we could see some movement on this one, mainly just because of the narratives that are going to be painted within the next two months within these ecosystems. You've got Breakpoint happening during uh, Token 2049. That's actually happening now or this weekend. And then you have Avalanche coming up here in the next uh, 30, 45 days. We'll see a lot, I think, that will release at their summit in um, Argentina. So be on the lookout for that. All right, as I said, get into the Diamond Circle. It's a great place to get additional content. Follow me out there on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.